All right, y'all, we're on episode two of Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down a drug lord. This episode's called Twin Call Me. Uh, well, we ended off the last episode, Little Village. They were three months into their hustle. Their brother got locked up. People started approaching them, so they, they got into the game. And it's three months later. So let's see how this goes. With money comes power. And sometimes people could get lucky. They're not the smartest people that get lucky and they have that money that shouldn't have power. And they say power corrupts. What you see us today as is what you've seen us before. It didn't change us. In those early points, the guy that's willing to stand in front because he got a good debt on, like can really throw a punch, doesn't necessarily have any leadership skills or abilities. It's funny because, because um, people call us nerds and stuff. I'm like, yo, that's a compliment to me. It's pretty tough to make me feel like that ain't cool now. In the beginning, nerd wasn't cool. That was like Urkel. Revenge of the Nerds was real. Back in the 80s when the nerds were the brunt of everybody's jokes and everybody was ogre, the masculine, non-nerd, bully shit, you know what I'm saying? But the reality is, Microsoft forward, nerds took over the world, you know what I'm saying? Nerds nerds run the world now. Nerds and old devils, you know what I'm That seems to be the question around the whole, are they snitches, are they not snitches? Did anybody expect them to not testify? They weren't street dudes, they were businessmen. I've heard that said about. So far into the story, neither one of them seemed to have the strong hand as far as being the one to be able to give pushback. So far, we've seen two brains coming together to create a mastermind. You doing things like, because you watch a lot of movies, a lot of videos, uh-huh. you're going to fail. If I did everything that they did, I'd be dead yeah. and broke. Like I tell them, I'd be dead <laughs> and broke. And that's the reality. The reality, if they was out there, if they were the ones out there, hands on guns, busting and doing all the shit you see on TV, they would have been gone. They would have never, their business would have never made it nowhere. Wouldn't have made it past that first three months. Wouldn't have got to them first millions. People, they like, think that we're trying to glamorize life. What we want you to know is that there's a lot of suffering, y'all. Yo. And this is Surviving El Chapo, the twins who brought down the drug war. The dad, a fugitive in Mexico, the brother, in prison. I remember um, having a note left in our door at my brother's house where we were staying at. It was a note that said, um, Cuate, llamame. Twin, call me. When I did call, it was, um, it was Tommy. He was my brother's um, connect or his source of forgetting drugs. He tells me, look, I just pulled into the McDonald's right here on Kids in 26 to meet him. You know, and he stands and greets me. How you been? How's your brother? He tells me right away, like, listen, I'm, I'm going to cut the bullshit. I wanted to offer you work to see if you wanted to uh, work with me. I got kilos of cocaine and um, I wanted to know if you needed some. I'm pretty sure that you and your brother can move it. I, I'm interested, but I, I'm not sure if I, you know, could help you really, you know? Like, let me call someone I know that might be interested. I call him, you know, my, you know, this trusted friend of our family. It seems like this is the original conversation between the brothers connect and themselves. So this is pre the three months. This is pre the money under the bed. Um, this is how they got the ball rolling. He ends up becoming our very first customer. You know, he doesn't take me too serious. I'm still nervous. Like, you know, I don't have no money to buy him. Like, no, don't worry. I'm going to lend them to you. Just be careful, you know? Consignment on the first rip. I guess the brother had a decent rep with the connect. I'm going to be sending my brother, you know, to go see you. I remember going home and him showing up. He gets off the front seat, jumps in the back seat. I know what he's doing, like, from my stash with my brothers. Like, there's a stash department. When I go get the bag, and when I pull it over my shoulder, I'm like, what the? You know, it's heavy. And I open the bag, and I see that there's, like, bricks and bricks in there. I'm like, start counting them, and there's 30 kilos. So I call him. I'm like, man, I think your brother made a mistake. He sent me 30 kilos. And he laughed. He said, look, Tony, don't worry, man. You're going to do good. Don't worry about it. Just do what you got to do. Call me when you... When you had some money. Yo, all of that muscle memory that they went through, all of that training that they went through with their old man, all of that led up to that moment when you got an eager connect that already knows your background, that already knows your family's background, that wants to put down a load on you and see what you can do. Now, nah, you fuck it up. You have to pay the price. But these guys, whose hands better to drop 30 kilos in? Y'all have no choice but to make this happen. That was a sh like a big moment. Hell I yeah. remember me and my brother talking to me. He's having the keys like, what are we going to do? We're going to sell them. Now, we're, we're going to sell them. Absolutely. I was excited. And I'm like, oh, we got this. Yeah. Like, I'm going to respect. They've been waiting. You've been waiting your whole life for this moment, man. Y'all ain't go to college for nothing, man. You was put through the ringer. You was you was in the game, man. You saw the game. You seen how it worked. This was some opportune situation for you. My older brother had um, 
these dash compartments made in the in our home and one of them was in my bedroom it was a mirror a mirror on the wall and it would have two remote controls and throw all the kilos in there so that their brother had a little situation already the older brother armando probably ran around with the dad before he went to prison because he seemed to know the business too and know his business he got compartments in his bedroom he got a connect that's eager to go mess with his brother so evidently he did that business he was horrible when it came to paying the bills and you know keeping the platform right but he seemed to have had his own little system and situation going good before they popped him. then calling that customer come over yeah how many did he expect to get how many did the customer even expect to get you know what i'm saying he reluctantly told the twins, hey, you know what I'm saying? I, I cop something from you. But he come back with 30 kilos. I showed him. Look. He was like, he peels back the layers himself. And he's like, oh, man, you got some kilos. Like, you really got one. Yeah, he didn't have no faith in him, man. I mean, he had enough faith to tell him, yeah, I'll cop with you. Now they're there. They got product in hand. Let's see what happens. He's like, holy shit. Like, look, man. Don't tell nobody you have them, you know? Let me make some calls. We seen his eyes lit up. We knew when he did that, he was like, I'm going to take advantage of this situation. Hell yeah, we're in business. We're in business. You know, he knows them, good friend of the family, understands the family, knows it's a hustling family. Again, these guys got the eager connect, ready to do their thing. The product is already in hand on consignment. Now it's just get on the phone, make the moves, and get into the hands of who needs to have it, and run back with that bread and re-up. And I think instantly we started kind of like saying, we're not going to depend on one person. He'll have us literally by the balls if he was our only customer. He takes them. By the end of the night, like he came back with the money. I think it took us longer to count the money that they didn't actually sell the kilos. We don't have no money machine. Yeah. Put them thumbs to work, Papa's. It was like maybe 20 something thousand, but it was still a lot of money for us. We were 17 years old. We were 17. That day, you know, I said it before, we were hooked. We were addicted to that life. Jewelry, cars, clothes, going out. You know, we had to pay to every, going into every club. We're 17. We want to be where all the adults are. You easily spending $1,000 a day on anything. Food, yeah, food, food, restaurants. We were used to eating good. Right. Some steak dinners Poppy was talking about. You know what I'm saying? We need steak. <laughs> we were wasting a lot of money and we were like a walking billboard. Once we had that million dollars. We're like, with this, we could buy 50 kilos cash, right? Make 100 grand four times a month. Like, we can't live, even if we did it once a month, we can't live off that. Something's wrong with us. It wasn't long until we started having problems with the Fed. Mm. That we were doing a lot of dumb things. I'm sure. Imagine. That would have never been able to happen today. A couple of 17-year-olds, they would have internetted themselves to death. They would have been in joint a long time ago off of just Instagram, just Facebook, putting their business out there. So uh, I'm sure they made some mistakes at 17, getting that bread, putting up a million dollars. You got your business up and running. They watching. The feds was watching, I'm sure. So with no one else to turn to, they decided to take a quick trip down to Mexico to call off with the feds and get some much needed fatherly advice. Yeah, that's another question I got. How long after they got into it did the old man know about it and how he didn't show up on some, let me see what's going on over here. Unless he doesn't know yet, we'll see. I still remember going to being in Mexico and my father sitting us down and he pointed out our, our mistakes. You're already on the run? He said, listen, you guys got to figure out what you guys want. You're here. Like, where are you going to live? Mm -hmm. Where's your car at? You didn't think about none of that. You're just here. You spent your money. Just no money to run. You need money to run, man. Your money on, on what he would call dumb things and, and bullshit. And he would tell me, I want to let you know something. Prison's hard. Mm. Prison is hard. See, now that's another thing, man. You know, they talk this nerve shit, but you in a game that leads to prison. At any moment, would they, you know what I'm saying? Would they testify had they got popped that time that they were on the run to Mexico? Like, it's a character thing at the end of the day. For a couple kids who thought it was hard on the chicken farm, prison's a whole different deal. And you guys don't want to go to prison. He's right. I don't want to go to prison. I don't. And I think it was a wake-up call, like, okay, we're only going to start focusing on, on what we're going to do and what we're doing wrong. It helped that when we got back, the feds were still on us. It was funny, we never said, let's just stop. Like by that time, the greed was so set in that you're like, there's too much money to be made. Yeah, your muscle memory kicked in. Your breathing kicked in. 
There ain't no turning back from that. Problem is you already got eyeballs on you. Or how do you kill them watching you and get back to business? See how they handle it. You're wondering where two 17-year-olds learn the entrepreneurial skills to start their own business. They learn it from the same place many kids do. Hey, hi, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yeah, that's right. I go to McDonald's. I apply for the job. They give me the job. I love the job. In the sense of responsibility a little bit. I seen that there was nothing but 15 and 16-year-old kids working at McDonald's. Buddy went and got the front, the McDonald's front. Got to make a living, right? Got to pay your rent somehow. He's about to get the blueprint from Ronald McDonald himself. And I'm thinking like, man, they're making McDonald's with millions and millions of dollars. Some of the workers at that time didn't know English, probably didn't know how to read, they didn't know how to write, but guess what? They made that restaurant be one of the so, most successful yeah. restaurants in the city. Why did it be created this system where you can't mess it up? Like, well, you can't mess it up, man. You can learn how to run a McDonald's on a you create the infrastructure to the business and then it basically runs itself. You pay attention, you tweak, tinker, and adjust. And there you have it. Dudes are pretty smart, man. Oh, lunchtime was packed. There's a guy, like, they're making money, yeah. like, value. We're learning that value. And I think that helps as well, because later on in my career, like, I had to do the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing hundreds of kilos at a time. You know, predicting. predicting what we're going to need. The first of the month come around, I, I'm going to need a lot. In the middle of the month, I'm going to have another wave. Projections. They was making projections. I think me and my brother took that concept and how to treat our workers, you know, and what we could do for them to make them feel more comfortable, more safe. You know, we're going to take that and continue to grow it and, and, and learn from that. Those tedious little details like that. McDonald's win the extra mile to make, a, you know, the ketchup pump and the mustard pump to release the exact amount of mustard, the exact amount of ketchup needed for the burger to taste the same every time. Consistency, man. Consistency in any business, the biggest key. Get, that's why people go to McDonald's, not because it's great burgers, because you know what you're gonna get. Later on, I remember telling them, look, this is gonna be our system, because the last thing you wanna do is have kilos missing. Working at McDonald's thinking like, there's a lot of moving parts, you know what I'm saying? You don't want, in a, in a business like drugs, you don't want no breakage. It happens, but you don't want it, man. You want to you wanna make sure that everything's on the up and up and that everything gets to where it's got to be in the in the manner in which it was supposed to get there, in the manner in which the customer was expected. Even at the beginning stage, like, man, you drop something, throw that shit out. It didn't cost you nothing, man. Give the customer what they want. It ain't costing you nothing. The one time, one of the older Mexican guys that was working there, he was from Mexico, didn't know English. We went, got a block of cheese, and the cheese fell on the floor. The floors are greasy. Nasty. They're dirty. Walked on. Now, he picked up the block of cheese. Now it looks like pepper jack cheese. He was about to put it back on the cheese container thing. And my brother like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and then we look at each other and we're like, it's not your fucking cheese. There's a thousand blocks of cheese in the freezer. Trust me, McDonald's not gonna care. They gonna care more. They gonna give a damn. You give them that hairy floor cheese. You know what I'm saying? More that you give somebody some cheese with hair on it. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's just the mentality that you would think it's common sense. Nah, common sense. Hence the name. We had that problem with even some of our people. Well, they'll be like, no, no, I'm not going to leave that there. We'll be like, it's not yours. Don't worry about what's going to be lost. Worry about yourself. In the street, you're going to hear a lot of people say they got shot because they wouldn't give up their, their chain. And me and my brother always looked at it like, if you get me in that position, you won. It's yours. Tomorrow, I'll go buy another one. Learn to take a loss. Breakage, part of the game. Do all my brother got a little sense of power too that he wanted to abuse right away. I'm in charge of sending people to do things and he's not happy that he has to go clean up the parking lot. And he's like, bro, so you, are so, you really gonna send so, me out there? Yes. My brother could have chose any one of the other 12 workers there and he would decide to choose me. He's still salty about that. For some reason, he thought he was teaching me a lesson. To me, I was just like, oh, you just wanted to rub it in. I wanted my brother to feel okay that he works at McDonald's. You work, you're good, bro. Like, so what? So what? At the crib, you sitting on million. He wanted to make sure that I felt comfortable working with that. I was <laughs> like, do me a favor. But you know what? You could want more. You could want more. You don't have to be like, oh I'm my God, I that. love cleaning up the whole parking lot with a broom. Hey, you. Yo, they harping on this, boy. That's a touchy subject. He never forgave his brother for that. Hey, you can tell this touchy subject. Damn. Yeah. This is going to be like the template of what our no, like, I'm that. relationship is going to be. Okay, ask you, what's the big deal? So it's funny how we would go through these motions. Anyways, it was a great experience for the both of us, I think.
The neighborhood McDonald's in Little Village, Chicago was an old haunt for the Flores family. It was the very spot where their father made the deal that got him arrested and where the twins made their first ever deal that got their business started. Infamous McDonald's. We started implementing little things that we could do. First of all, we can't have drugs where we're living, so we need somewhere to Absolutely. put them away, which cost stash them. Or... So we started off with garages in regular neighborhoods, a bunch of them, though. You know, okay, we're going to invest in, in vehicles with stash compartments. Instead of buying one or two, we said, okay, well, let's buy three or four. After you started making the money, it, it wasn't about the money anymore. It was about this is what we do. Right. It was about functionality at that point. Once you got the bread, it's like, okay, how can I fine tune this business to grow this bread, keep this bread coming, keep the feds off my back? Why buy one when we could buy three? Stash them out. It's not shit where we eat. Let's get everything out the crib. Get four or five garages, spread it out. One gets hit. Still got three more somewhere else. You got the money. At this point, the game is adjust and fine tune the machine. For me and my brother, I, I think there was times where we didn't know how much money we had. We just know we had a lot of money. Our friend... Gus, he takes us to the to the shop and says, look, buy these money machines. And I'm like, do I really need it? He's like, do you want to do a thing? It's a time saver. That's another thing you're doing when you're adjusting the process. How do you go to money? Time is money. You want to minimize time. You want to minimize breakage. You want to minimize mistakes. Things right? Or do you want to keep doing things the way you're doing? And he pulls two money machines out and it was like $6,000. I was like, $6,000? I can count it by hand. That's crazy because you're thinking so far ahead on everything else. But you're looking at these money machines like they're nothing. It's time consuming or you got to pay somebody to sit there and do that shit. You don't want nobody counting your money. Later on, I was like, that was one of the best decisions yes. I ever made. It brought our, our business to a different level when you could package your money and send it like the way they do it. Whether it was a million dollars or... 50 minutes, nah, and then it saves time, you know, man, it saves time. And I remember the machines, I tell you, it was my favorite machine. Like, I looked for it everywhere. It was like a Toyocom NC50. With the business we were doing, we burned through a lot of machines. Every month, we were going to buy four machines. Every month, we were spending 15, 20 grand on new money. What, what was so sad when they were like, oh, we don't make them no more. We only refurbish them. I'm like, what? It wasn't long before Pete had a gun put to his head in a home invasion. And the extra attention certainly didn't help them with the feds. We started noticing that they would be there from early morning to mid-afternoon, and we felt like we're going to have more patience than them. We started making that our schedule. Get up 5, 6 in the afternoon, hit the streets, go make sure we were not being followed. We will park our regular cars with our phone, take the battery off our phones, park the cars, and go jump in our other car and go to work where we called it. We could be out delivering drugs, collecting money, counting money, all through the night, early morning hours. Once we knew it was like 5, 6 in the morning, okay, it was time for us to go back home and go to sleep and let them sit there all day. <laughs> Came in operation, man. Got them sitting outside looking stupid. Or you getting money all night. Whatever works. You got to move when it's opportune for you. When you can get your business done and make it happen and there's nothing to interfere with that. Then you come home and you sleep while them jerk off sit outside. We also started to find out that we were the people that were they were interested in. So we could get other people to do our business for us. Then we could be selling drugs while we were sitting at home. So not long after that, we acquired our first worker who was a... Uh, Really close friends of us growing up. That's what's crazy that they was already they already had put a lot of money on the street. They already had the feds' eyes on them, and they're already getting these money counters, and they're already putting this money in play, and they still didn't even have no staff. And the way we started training them to a business that almost came natural to us, we started noticing that he would make dumb decisions. It's like, yo, what are you doing? Like, and that kind of was taught us that what we knew. We couldn't expect someone else to understand or know. Mm. If it was that he parked the car in the garage the wrong way. At the end of the day, that's when the twins, I'm sure, had to take McDonald's approach. You know, write the drug dealing for dummies manual. Make sure that they had a system and an operation in play. That if you stuck by the guidelines of this, everything will be just fine. You can't have dudes making decisions for your business. The business has to make the decision for the work. I think naturally, without even noticing, we were kind of, we started becoming leaders, right? You wouldn't question us. When you got people around you that can be led, they're not going to question you. If you're able to pick up on all of these things that they don't know, and it makes sense to them. Oh, I parked the car this way. You told me I shouldn't. This is why. Okay, I'm going to listen to you. You got so much of that kind of wisdom, so much of that kind of knowledge. They're not going to question you. They don't know shit. The one that questioned you, the one that does question you, he got to go. You gotta push him on. He can't be led. 
we're going to start kind of implementing a system that we didn't know at that time it was from what we learned, you know, working at McDonald's. I think the biggest thing to get someone's respect like that was that they seen us, like I'd get in the car and put, you know, 45, 50, 60 kilos in the back seat and deliver them myself. Like I didn't have a problem doing that. And if there was a situation where I didn't feel comfortable doing it, I wouldn't have someone else doing that. He's being a leader, put his neck on the line, you know, system in play. You know, go to the stash house and um, get 50 kilos. Call me when you're at the house. Before you leave, confirm the count. Before you get to the house, drive around, make sure there are no funny cars in the neighborhood. As soon as you walk in the house, before you even go to the kilos, check the front door, check the mailbox. Like the last thing you want is bills piling up in front. We also found out that having one social supply wasn't good. We were, we were depending on one person, so we had to start branching out and we didn't like the in and out in these like regular neighborhoods they increase traffic like people get nosy and then in those neighborhoods where the cops pull you over because you're suspicious they pull you out the car and they search your car they don't ask and that's all it takes that's all it takes is some neighbor to say hmm what they doing in that garage over there call the police let's not pretend karen's didn't exist then karen's was all over the place karen's was the nosy neighbor that was going to call because your music was too loud or or, or there's too much movement in your gangway going to your garage, or there's too much movement in the alley going to your garage. Boom, you pop. They say, get the fuck out the car right now. And you're like, oh, here's my license, and they'll slap you. Literally. So we never took no drugs to Little Village. You know, we'd buy brand new cars and we'd equip them. And we were actually, we were shopping for, for clothes. I'd be like, give me that car, that one, and that one, and that one. And we try to have a consistent car, like a consistent car, consistent color, and yeah. that wouldn't look suspicious going, you know, you have a stash house and you don't want 10 different cars coming in there or a shiny car where it's like, hey, that's, why so many cars going in there? So along with the cars came nice houses. Houses that for all intents and purposes look like someone lived there, furniture and all, but the only thing actually living there, piles and piles of drugs. We're fortunate enough to, to have a, Surplus is what they had. They had a stockpile of cocaine. A woman introduced us by one of our sources. Her name was Ashley. She was deep into like this fraud life. So she would go to these renters in high end, you know, neighborhoods and be like, um, you know, human resources for all state. We're bringing a bunch of employees, we need housing. Not only would she do that, she would go furnish the house. And we just paid her very well. And it, it was perfect to feel like that she was so trustworthy. She becomes like intimate, like we become really good friends. And so they ba basically had Ashley. Ashley was just an actress, a scammer, going there, tell everybody they're from all state. They pay for the rent and keep a stash house as long as she's good business. Ashley, she just became part of the team. Right. She was a character because she was a bipolar. We, and we had to worry about people's mental health. Like we had to take care of them and doctors. And, and that's just someone who gets us the house. And we have the people who get us the cars and the people who do the compartments and people who work for us. I mean, you can... it's a lot of moving parts a lot of people's problems, a lot of different characters, people that might be for price, they sell your information to somebody, you know what I'm saying? You never know. It's a lot of moving parts, man. It was the whole chain of being like logistical and, and being a manager, right? So I would say like I would have been a beast at Amazon. We don't trust no one. I'm checking the work. I'm making the deals. We had to evaluate the price between when am I going to receive these keys, wherever where they're going, and what's the price right now? How we're looking? 500,000 kilos sitting in uh -huh. Mexico. You, know, like, you got 1,000 kilos in California. In the, in the border, you know, across the border. You got, you know, four or 500 kilos in transportation. You got to bring the money back. The truck weighs a certain way. So we had 350 kilos in there and we calculated that. Every bill weighs around a gram. Uh -huh. So you're like, okay, I can fit the same amount of money. Money. So I would Wait, I would package the money on a thousand bills, uh -huh. which is a kilo. You literally have a, a load of money is weighing two tons to send back. To send back, so you get on the scale, and the truck gets on the scale. It's supposed to weigh something, and it's over. You have a problem. If you don't think about that, then you're not doing right. So we have to calculate what they're weighing. Logistics, man. You gotta, you gotta take that amount off so that a scale balances back out to zero. That weight don't exist. You know what's the weight they're gonna give you? Right. Because money weighs a lot. When it's in bulk, that's a whole process on its own. And it's one of the harder parts of uh, the business, believe it or not, like transporting bulk. I, I do believe that sometimes with everything that we know, we make great consultants for the government for the right percentage. Everything that they're doing is not working. They're already trying to sell the secrets and shit. They want to cut a side deal with the government. Like, yo, 
Who can sell child for a certain percentage of everything that falls off? Everything you catch. <laughs> wow. Downtown life was like safe at the time and quiet and we could eat there, shop there and live there. And it felt like home. Like, I mean, you know? that was our playground. Just, you know, like we implemented these little things. Like, for instance, all workers always had collared shirts. This blue one, you know, downtown workers, right? Put on your shirt. When you're driving, see put on, easy, just follow the rules, things that we're not going to stick out. Those are just, those little things we implemented to be able to, like. Those little things go a long way. Those little adjustments, those little details, they go such a long way because all it takes is you wearing a hoodie or a hat or looking a certain way to catch the eye of somebody that you don't want watching you. And how old were you at this point? 20. 20 getting money. I remember when I met Jay. He actually shook my hand and I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> you know, everybody's not that polite and he was just well-mannered. There's a couple more important characters I'd like to introduce you to who are pivotal to the twin story. Meet Val. Val had a mm. reputation in the local scene back then. Think, say, 90s Kim Kardashian. She was the OG known for her extensive use of plastic surgery and her stylish fashion choices. But pink was her go-to color. So she became known as Barbie because she looked so much like the doll. Val and Jay got together and eventually married. My dad is a Chicago police officer and he raised me and my sibling to the best that he could. And I felt like at the time I was around the wrong crowd and I felt like I kind of got addicted to being with a bad boy because they were mysterious. I just was in a situation where there was people around me and, you know, they were bringing drugs from California to Chicago. And I started off by being a mule. And a mule is somebody that would take a trip whether it's to LA or whether it's to Mexico and bring drugs back to Chicago. And I started that at a very young age, 18 years old. I felt like I don't need to depend on anyone. I could do it myself. I just started getting addicted to this lifestyle and I just continued to take these trips and I continued to risk my life. I would drive from Mexico to Chicago without stopping. I was fearless. I come from a family of law enforcement. Every time that I would get stopped, I was like just name dropping and everybody knew who my family was. How many times that worked for you, huh? That's a whole lot of back and forth, talking to police, telling them your family name, going down them routes. I felt like invincible and I felt like I was never gonna get caught. I was only gonna allow my parents you know, to see what I wanted them to see. I would tell them what they wanted to hear because I didn't want them to worry about me. So All that talking about your family's name and it don't get back to your old man that you back and forth down the routes. I don't understand that either. So as I was taking all these trips to Mexico, I always had a reason for not being there. And it's like I never wanted them to worry. So it's like I almost lived this double life. I got caught in Mexico. The car was in my name. Another worker was supposed to bring it up. They kind of got scared and didn't want to drive it. So I immediately jumped in like, I'll just take it myself. There is these border stops. They'll pull you over and they have these checkpoints. They'll lift your car up on a lift and they'll start checking, you know, the gas tanks. They dropped the gas tank and they found the drugs. They put me in front of a judge and less than 72 hours, and they sentenced me to 10 years. She's kind of a distraction right now for me in this reaction because I'm not sure where they're at in the timeline, and I'm, I'm wondering what's missing from this story and if they're going to talk about certain things. Let's talk about the rest of the episode. They gave you the bare bones blueprint of any operation, anything, any business that you want to do, anything that you want to do, if you got a plan, you have a strategy, you have a policy, you have a protocol. You got all of these things in line and you make it to where your employee and you make it to where your employees can't fuck up. That's good business. They took the McDonald's blueprint and took it to cartel life. And it worked for them for however long it worked for them. But they had a position in play 
for every move. They had a an answer for every question. And it took them going back to work at McDonald's and figure that out. So lesson learned. Get that money. Watch that money every step of the way. Ronald McDonald gave these motherfuckers the secret to success. Subscribe to the channel. See you for episode three.